Dr. Rula al Habashni from Jordan University of Science and Technology. She is a periodontist, associate professor, and uh, she got the Diplomate American Board in Periodontology in 2005. And she is the chairman of Preventive, preventive Department Hi, in the university. Uh, Dr. Habashni will talk about short implants. Also, thanks to the Predent Group for giving me this opportunity to talk. And today we will talk about short dental implants. And uh, we just heard from our colleagues how it's hard to augment the deficient red and you know the morbidity and you know the problems with it. So probably if we can reach a conclusion that you know we can place a short dental implant will help us, you know, to you know, do these cases without the problems of the, the augmentations and the others. Okay, so the outline for our lecture, our presentation today, we're gonna describe what is meant by short implant. We will learn what kind of evidence support the advertising claims of placing short implant we see in our journals and practices. And we will know the challenges associated with the placing regular length implants. Also, we will understand the factors to consider before placing short implants and at the end understand the situation where short implant can work. Can we place it in each single patient or there are special circumstances that you know, then a short implants can work. So what is short implants? You know, you know, looking at the definition of short implant, there is no consensus in the definition of short implants. Like for instance, some researcher like Freiburg, Freiburg said it is less than seven. Griffin and Chewing said it is under 10 millimeter. Somebody else like said it's eight millimeter or less. And in, there's like a big review by Olate, they consider short implant as less than eight. And basically, what, when I looked at the literature, most of the systematic review, they consider anything below t 10 millimeter is a short implant. So a nine is considered a short. And in some research, when they talk about the six millimeter, they consider it as ultra short implants. So on the other hand, so what is a wide implant? A wide implant is a fixture with a 4.5 millimeter or more in diameter, okay? And the narrow one is the one that is less than 3.5 millimeter. So according to the width, if it is more than 4.5, we can consider it as a wide diameter implant. Shorter than an implant doesn't mean many implants because some folks thinks that placing these little screws or the mini implant, the short and the narrow ones as a short implant. The answer is sorry, no. You need to have the width if you are reducing the length. So we're not talking about mini implants, which is small in diameter. We're talking about just length, being short in length. So just to remind you with the development of the dental implant, starting from the rudimentary hollow baskets to allow for bone growth, and going in the 80s for the root form, screw form or tapered form, and the cylinder, the tapped one. And going nowadays with the modern root form, starting with the narrow and long implants, and moving to the short and wide diameter implant, and nowadays, hopefully, the short and modified form implants. And what we mean by modified forms is the modified surface that will allow for successful result with a short length of implants. Okay, we have to remember, as Daniel Boozer said, that over 80% of our patients receiving implant treatment are partially odontulous. What does this mean? This means that we're gonna have patients with a single restoration. And these patients with single restoration, we know they're gonna carry a lot of load on these implants. So placing a short implant for a patient, a partially edentulous patient, will be more problem or will be, let's say, carrying more load than a fully edentulous where they have their implants splinted together. 
Just to remind you also that whenever we consider placing implants, especially in the posterior region of the maxilla or the mandible, we have the anatomical consideration, you know, starting with the nerve in the mandible and with the maxillary sinus. It's all, you know, you know, preventing you from placing a regular length implant. You know, and there's a lot of times but you're really very close to the ID canal or the sinus. And when you take your three-dimensional x-rays, you can notice that. So in the maxilla, we have the nasopalatine area and the nasal floor, nasopalatine canal, which can be closed when you place your central, lateral, or canine. And you need to be careful about that. Also the maxillary sinus, which we know that usually pneumatize due to the internal and the external resorption, and sometimes really limit you from placing anything distal to the five. In the mandible, the inferior canal, the bundle, the nerve, and the arch, everything there is really, you know, of a challenge. And the mental area also is not easy. So also, sometimes we'll have presence of accessory mental foramen in the distal area not between the four and the five but going distal to the six area you will have this accessory mental foramina which can you know cause paresthesia to the patient presence of bifid inferior and dental canal you have like two baths interforaminal area the presence of a neurovascular incisive canal presence of anterior looping of the mental nerve Sometimes it's really very high up, very close to the ridge. And lingual foramina position, you have to, sorry. You have to remember that the lingual foramen, sometimes it's not always just in the middle one. It could be very low or very high. And sometimes 20% it could be bara in the right or the left. So placing any implants in this area Perforating the, the lingual plate will jeopardize this foramen. And as I said, the, the, sometimes the mental foramen, the, the inferior dental canal, once it's starting as a mental very high here, and the incisive ones really here, continuing as incisive, sometimes it's really very hard to place anything in this area. And, you know, I would recommend any person who wants to place implants is to try as much as possible to take the Combeam. The CTs, they re are really, really very helpful and handy in you know, knowing your anatomy and knowing where you, uh, where you are. These are just sections of the CTs we take in our department. Uh, whenever we have patients you know, with, let's say, limited bone available, we took the CTs for the upper and the lower jaw, and you can appreciate that we can measure the exact distance from the sinus to the ridge and know our anatomy before we go ahead and start you know, our work. So you really know where is your bundle, and if you can go a little bit you know, buckle to it, or how much length you have in your areas. So, you know, with, with all these anatomical limitations and with all these troubles, there should be always a solution for, you know, placing implant. And one of the, let's say, suggested solution is to place what they call zygomatic or angled implant. And to be honest with you, these ones are really very hard. A periodontist can, cannot place. They need a surgeon. Uh, they are really very hard. And the problem with them as the systematic review said, that they, because they are angled, they carry a lot of load. So after function, they usually fail because of the axis of the load in them. So even if you, if they are osseointegrated, they will not function in a proper way later. So what's the drawback of augmentation? As my colleagues talked about augmentation, it's very complex. You know, nobody likes to spend a lot of time, you know, doing these complex kind of a treatment. It requires adjunctive treatment. The success rate is not that much high. And it's very invasive kind of a treatment. 
Also, the patient perception of likelihood of pain or other problems, you know, usually the patient will encounter kinds of problems. They, they're gonna even refuse the idea of replacing their missing teeth. There's fears of the side effects. It's very long treatment. Usually you have to do it staged. You do the grafting, wait, and then come back to place your implants. And it's also costly. You have to pay for the membrane, for the surgery, for the sedation, for all these things. So it means it will bulk the cost of the implant. They also, looking in the literature for the success rate of the grafting, it has been said that by Tomiti and the others, that the only one graft were found to be associated with 9.6% failure rate of implants subsequently placed at this site. So we are talking about a 10% failure in these grafted areas. Uh, and alveolar regimentation is considered to be a factor in possible long-term failure of the implants. Another systematic review said that the survival rates of implants in a grafted site is only 92 to 100%, I mean, it could reach, and 76 to 100 for only one graft over one to seven years. So there is a chance of failure in these grafted, augmented, you know, sites when you place implants in them. So as also Marcos Esposito in his review said that complication, especially for vertical augmentation of the reserved mandible are very common. So we don't want to hustle and spend time in trying vertically to augment the posterior parts of the mandible because you know the complications is going to be always there so what to do can we place really short implants let's talk a little bit about biomechanics and understand it we all know that you know when we buy with like force on these teeth the amount of force in the anterior area is less than 100 Newton, while in the posterior areas, it can exceed 500 Newton. Where do you think we always have, you know, short arch or short length? We need the short length. Yes, we're gonna need it in the posterior because in the posterior we have the ID, we have the maxillary sinus, so we have to remember there is extra forces in this area. So that's why we prefer long implant. Why we prefer them? Because we assume, or from the biomechanics, it makes sense that it improves the crown to implant ratio and the greater surface area available for osseointegration, right? And it will impose the occlusal surface. So everybody agree in this room that long implant is going to be perfect. So what is the scientific rationale then by, you know, suggesting placing short implants? Why they, you know, are telling us we can place short implants? Let's remember the osseointegration. If we look at the osseointegration, the relationship between the bone and the implant is the ankylosis, right? It's not like your tooth and your bony housing. You don't have these PDLs, you don't have these, you know, flexibility in things. So this type of ankylosis or strong relationship, you know, is rigid and it might withstand forces more than the teeth. And, you know, we can agree with that if we ask our patient, once they had their implant, they will tell you, you know, I can chew better now. I'm really chewing, you know, in the implant better than before because the, you know, the implants usually, if it's, you know, osseointegrate, it can carry a good load uh, because of the this, uh, you know, ankylosis relationship. The other things from the 3D model of the implants and bone, it all shows the finite element analysis and the 3D models that what 
exactly carry the load and what part of the bone carry the things is the first five millimeter in the crystal implant body. So if this five millimeter are the most important part to carry the load, then probably the middle part and the apical part of the implant is of what, let's say, not that much important. So you need to focus in the first five millimeter. And we're gonna see now how the research gonna try to help to advance you know, the things in these first five millimeter so they have really very strong interaction with the bone and they can withstand all these kind of forces there. So stresses around the implants during function and para function also are typically concentrated at the crest of the rib, unlike what occurs for a natural tooth and its periodontal membrane. So in a natural tooth, because of the presence of the periodontal membrane, the forces are going to the apex of the root, not only to the crystal part of the root. So increase of implant length from seven to 10 did not significantly improve its anchorage. Doesn't mean that a long implant will improve the anchorage. You know, let's look at this chart and try to understand what do we mean. We know that the implant in the bed will be you know, exposed to a lot of stresses, right? And these stresses will then come as strains and microfracture of the implant bone interface, right? You know, these kind of stresses, uh, there will be what we call, sorry. Okay, there will be here the transverse force component in this direction. The apical part will try to dislodge itself, you know, and, you know, theoretically speaking, the more the length is, the better the absorption of the strain. But if you look at this, you're gonna see that's the most important part for this, you know, force component, the compressive loads is the coronal part, okay? So there is no, let's say, you know, importance of the middle parts. The most important is the coronal. If this coronal part is gonna withstand the compressive forces and absorb all the strain, the implant will stay intact. And the crystal portion will stay in a good position without any loss, okay? So in order to enhance that, we need to work on the coronal part of the implants. And that's why we can add the fins or the threads and round type of threads also flare the neck as much as possible, self-tapping, modified shape, and tapered profile. And, you know, I mean, we all know, it's always, you know, the research trying or any kind of company, they're trying to improve the neck. And if you, like, remember, like the Astra implant or the new ITI implant or the Breedent implant, all these things, they're trying always to improve the neck of the implant, like making it micro-threads increasing like laser lock, you know, doing a lot of things so they really improve the bone interface in this critical area. So, you know, so now we can agree that we can reduce the length, but in order to be really sure that things are going well, we need to increase the diameter, right? Because increasing the diameter will increase the surface area and will make the neck stronger for the osseous integration. But how much is necessary to increase the, uh, the width of the implant? And is it really the width is more important than the length? Bone stresses appear around the necks of the implant and abutment implant. Stresses were lessened with wide diameter implant and lower length span bridges. And the review by Hagi, 2004 and Birdie, they noticed that for short implants, that increase in diameter improve the things. Now what's the problem of increasing the diameter that much? 
I mean, how much you can go? Can you go to six or seven or eight millimeter in width? What's the problem? Anybody? <laughs> can you go nine millimeter width? Yes, you're not gonna find a buckle plate. You're not gonna find enough width, okay? So you always want to leave how much millimeter buckle to the fixture or to the implant. You need to leave a two millimeter so you can keep the tissue. But nowadays, I mean, we can go really wide. Why? Who can tell me why we can go wide still and keep the crest of the bone intact? I mean, before we can't go that much wide because we worry about the gaps and the problem. What's the development that make us now go wide but keep the crest intact? <laughs> what? No, no, <laughs> no, just remember, okay, when we had wide implant and the abutment is connected to it, what's going to happen, the gaps will cause the crystal bone loss, right? And that's what we, yes, exactly, <laughs> you got it, okay, so the platform switching nowadays and that's why most of the Bone level implants nowadays, they have the platform switching. Because of the platform switching, you don't worry anymore about the micro gaps because you internalize the things. So you can go wide. And I, I advise everybody, if they're gonna play some wall or anything, to go wide if they use short implants because with the platform switching, you don't have that strapping, okay? All right. So, you know, we say that, you know, now the forces, we understand that we don't need that much long, but what about the crown implant ratio? We always remember from our prosthetic classes that in teeth, crown root ratio is an issue. And whenever we want to restore a broken tooth and think about crown lengthening and placing a post, the question from our staff is always, you know, look at the crown root ratio. And the crown root ratio in teeth are really a valid point. And that's why, because of the shape of the roots and the PDL, okay? So if you don't have that much length left, it's not gonna withstand the long crown and the forces on it. But how about implants? Does this apply the crown root ratio or the crown implant ratio to the implants? Yeah, the research, on Branamark's implant by Tawil in 2006, in their study of short implant, they noticed there is no effect of the crown root ratio in the implants. If they go double or even more, it's still favorable even in the broxar. And what you have usually to notice for the crown root ratio, you're looking mainly at what? And if you want to see there are gonna be trouble from the crown root ratio. You're gonna look at the marginal bone level. If there is any changes in the marginal bone level. So if the marginal bone level stay intact, there is no changes, then this is not an issue anymore. Other studies, in a retrospective study, in 20, uh, 294 patients using the same implant type, receiving at least one single tooth implant, and I'm saying one single, not connected or splinted implant, over 2.3 years to seven years, they noticed that implant success or failure was not related to variation in the crown implant ratio. So this is really promising that the crown root ratio, even in a single restoration, can work. Also, another study by Eurydenta, he said you can go and implant, you know, this is really a big number, up to four, 0.95, five, like five times the crown root rate of the implant root ratio and still be in a good shape, okay, without, you know, further bone loss or any problems. Also, in ITI implants, blends in a 10-year prospective study, they noticed that, you know, going to two or three times more is still acceptable and there is no marginal bone loss. So, now the the, I mean, the problem of crown root ratio, or crown implant ratio, is not an issue because as we you know, saw from the literature, that you know, there wasn't any changes or any troubles from these things. So what's the advantage of short implants? You know, the advantage is 
basically is to let you not to do bone grafting. It's not anymore necessary because you don't need to increase the height of the bone, the available bone to place a regular length implant. There will be less money, pain and time for the patient. And it's a simple surgery, very simple by the way. You know, it's always like the angle will change or the problem with the clinician when they go very deep. But placing a short six, seven millimeter is really simple. And, and you know, the most important things is the angulation to load may be improved. It's always, you know, if you remember from the anatomy, we always sometimes try to incline a little bit because of the angulation of the adjacent root. If we don't place long implant, then we don't worry about the apical part of the adjacent root being angled. So the, 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 this has improved the insertion of the implant uh, without angles. But, you know, what are the factors that we need to consider in order to make these short implant works? I mean, from physics, biomechanics, it will work, but life is not like that much easy in the lab, like in the lab. You know, you have to look at your patient, analyze your factor in your patient in order to make or optimize the chances of success. So you always want to look at your patient that has parafunctional habits. Do not, I mean, as you know, we just said, Broxer, between Broxer and non-Broxer, the crown root ratio was not of an issue. But believe me, uh, patients with parafunctional habits, sometimes they can broke everything. <laughs> so you really want to make sure when you place implants for them is to, you know, optimize the thing so you don't have troubles. The vertical implant placement, if you place a short implant, don't place it angled because angle it with the angle forces on it, the load distribution will not be in a good shape. The prosthetic design, you really need a good prosthetic design with you know, the occlusal table, the things to work in a proper way. The alveolar bone equality, you don't want to place it in a type four bone, very mushy osteoporotic women, diabetic patient, that they have really poor quality of bone. The systematic health of the the systemic health of the patient, as I said, and the individual patient needs patient with high perception. They really like naggy patient. They worry that much. Don't give them very promising result by placing short implants too. We will, you know, also a little bit talk now about the research of short implants. You know, we understand that it can work and there is factor that help it work. But what about the literature or the research on the short implant? The early research or early on in the 90s, you know, short implant was absolute no because they always fail. They have, you know, more failure rate and especially in the maxilla. They were really absolutely contraindicated to place short implants in the uh, poor bone of the maxilla and you know a lot of studies, Bahat, Synerby, Good Care, all they said that they carry poor prognosis. But looking at the new research and the new systematic review, and there's plenty of them, by the way. I just picked you know three or four of them, but there is plenty of research or systematic review in short implants. If you look at this chart, or and you can tell that a lot of studies, MESH, Good Care, Freiburg, all of them, that their survival rate, cumulative survival rate, is you know, all very close to the 100. It's either you know, a little bit deviated, but not that much. It, it's never reached like less than 75%. It's always above 80 or 90%. So you can appreciate that the survival rate or the reported cumulative survival rate is kind of, you know, is high. <laughs> okay. And also in another systematic review by Carter Khan, if you can look at the, sorry. Okay. Now look at the numbers according to the years. You can see that 
by moving to 2010, that the survival rate, the success rate is, is, is getting higher. So we notice promising results and more better results in the recent days than in the previous days. So it's really promising results all over. And you know, the findings were two up to five years on average. And you know, it, the available evidence showed the promising results. Private practitioner like Fagozoto, you know, they also noticed promising 99% survival rate. Another meta-analysis, not only systematic review, but meta-analysis with number. They, you know, in partially or fully odontulous patients, you know, they find that is comparable to the long implant. Placement of short implants also is, is, is okay, but they say that probably after the first year, I mean, there is no long term that much studies, you know, the maximum study was only, or the, 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 I mean, the previous studies mainly up to five years. We don't have data more than five years. Tillman, you know, they noticed that the survival rate of implants in the maxilla is poorer than the mandible, especially among smokers. So the maxilla, if you compare it with the mandible, it's, you know, have lower chance or, you know, the survival rate is a little bit lower than the mandible. So the evidence base, this is, and this is, has been published in the evidence-based journal also as abstracting Tillman study, they said that the evidence for endorsing the use of short implants, there is no strong prognostic factor associated with an adverse outcome of using short implant, except as Tillman said, it's the maxilla and the smoker. The heavy smoker with uh, placing implants in the maxilla is really, you know, uh, probably not that much promising like in the mandible. Uh, Monji, this is uh, another recent study, you know, the estimated survival rate was 88%. This is a prospective. Just to remind you, the, the other reviews were mainly retrospective kind of a study. So looking at prospective type of study, we can see lower, let's say, chance or survival than the uh, retrospective studies. More research, now they're, they're trying to focus on the marginal bone loss and just showing not survival, but the amount of marginal bone loss and saying that is pretty much comparable between the long and short. As far as single tooth restoration, the only systematic review was published in J-Perio by Gesinger this year. He, when he looked at the studies, we were talking about single, not united or multiple teeth. He said that all the studies only looked at survival rate. Fogazotto is the only one who looked at Albergson criteria and measuring success rate, which is mainly the marginal bone loss. The others were mainly survival. So in single tooth restoration, we don't have enough evidence to support the short implants. So the prognostic factor that you, know, you might notice more failure in the maxilla, smooth surface versus roughened surface is absolute. Yes for the rough, no for the smooth. You know, Haggy and the others, everybody, uh, all, uh, they notice that it's better in the rough, sur with rough surface. No difference if you use a single stage versus two stage procedure. And of course, the factor for success again is the implant diameter. Two step surgical protocol is safer, you know, in order not to immediately load these implants. Uh, and assess the type of the bone, if it's type three or four, and splinting implants together without cantilever. Very dangerous to do cantilever and short implants. You really don't want to, you know, apply more loads in these short implants. The cantilever among prosthesis, just regular prosthesis, they usually carry a high failure rate. And with implants, short implants is not indicated. There is no, real research randomized study to compare between cantilever versus can non-cantilever, but I mean, it has been addressed as one of the prognostic factors. This is just to show you a few cases using, you know, short implants. 
uh, with regular uh, multiple trying to place multiple size multiple implants and so we can splint them together like play when you have very close to the mandible you know placing the upper six millimeter ITI implant with 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 regular size length implant splint them together there's another patient you know trying to place eight millimeter in the mandible splint the implants together in my practice I usually splint implants if they are short I don't place them single uh, you know unite them like uh, two or three implants uh, if I'm placing short implants as I told you the comb beam is really handy in this case you can see that the mental nerve is hiking really so we have to angle the implants and placing it you know it was at eight millimeter implants here we have another case for a molar okay so what's the strength of the available evidence we just talked about I mean is it, do we really have a strong evidence to endorse using short implants the studies that were available were mainly retrospective studies the level of recommendation of this guideline falls into class B which said should it's just a should recommendation and there wasn't any randomized controlled trial you know at that time to to say yes for the short implants okay so short length dental implant may require adapted protocol so you optimize the chances for success and you really need to select your patient and your implant you need an implant with a good design with a good surface to allow for you know better chance and there is a ongoing clinical trial on osteospeed uh, astro implant they are using a minimum of two in a maxilla trying to splint them together uh, with a six millimeter and a four millimeter width and they, they notice a very promising results and you know most of the system they have short options for implant like Stroman uh, the blue sky they have eight millimeter 4.5 by 4 or 5.5 and they uh, by horizon they have the laser look on the next so they can optimize the integration Bicon of course uh, say they are the leading or the first companies to propose the wide and big and fat you know implants short and fat implants so the take home message from uh, what we talk today is yes there is evidence but it is not strong and it's mainly drawn from retrospective studies not prospective there is no randomized trials to compare between short and regular length implant and in order to reach success but you can place them but to optimize your success rate you need to follow the protocol of your implant being one stage or two stage not to load or anything and to pay patient selection you really want to select your patient very carefully so you can have success at the end thank you very much <laughs>